just go to the website to see the eyeballs. Okay, we're live on YouTube. I'll be sending the link okay. in a second. Uh, please turn off your microphones if you're not the speaker so we don't get feedback. Yeah, please, please do keep your camera on and your microphone off. And uh, let us know if you want to intervene by writing your question or at least the main idea of your question in the chat so that we can uh, moderate quickly. Right, so welcome everyone uh, to our Princeton Bucharest virtual seminar in early modern philosophy, which will be tonight about the cards matter and laws to, so from the cards matters and laws to Cartesian cosmology is the title of the session tonight. We will have three speakers with three talks. And the first of the speaker is Nicolas Westberg from Boston College. His talk is on Cartesian matter and causality, the subject to visit it. Nicolas, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Just give me a second while I share the screen. Is it, all, is it all right if I begin? All right. Yeah. Well, I will focus on a very particular interpretive thesis about Descartes, namely the claim that Cartesian bodies are causes with respect to motion or changes in motion. Andrew Platt defends this view most recently in his 2020 book, One True Cause. He argues that Cartesian bodies are genuine causes of motion because bodies have intrinsically grounded powers to act upon other bodies. His textual basis is the laws of nature passages from part two of the Principia. In these passages, Descartes attributes force, tendency, and power to bodies. To cite a few important examples, uh, part two, section 43 states that, quote, what is in motion has some power of persisting in its motion. And then later in that section, he also speaks of, quote, the power of any body to act upon or to resist the action of another body. Now, according to Platt, these passages are evidence that Cartesian matter is not passive. But Platt goes further. Not only do bodies have real force, power, and activity, but these are grounded in the intrinsic properties of extension itself. Consider a case of bodily collision. The force that a body has to act upon another is determined by that body's size and speed. Since speed and size are modes of extension, extension's very properties thus determine force. And since force determines the outcome of a collision, extension causes the outcome of a collision. Thus, res extensa causes change, QED. Now, I want to push back on Platt's argument in two ways. In section one, I question whether we can use the passages about the laws of nature to attribute real properties to matter. And then in section two, I focus on Descartes' metaphysical commitments in both the principles and in relevant correspondences. Ultimately, I argue, uh, matter cannot be a cause, though it is a necessary condition of change. So section one on the laws of nature. Platt is not the first scholar in the past 30 years to appeal to the laws of nature passages in order to argue for matter's causality or intrinsic activity. These passages, however, cannot be used to ascribe real properties to matter. In the first place, the laws of nature passages taken on their own are underdetermined with respect to matter's causal or non-causal status. A good case in point is the central passage from uh, part two, section 43 on power. Descartes writes, this power to act on bodies consists simply in the fact that everything tends so far as it can to persist in the same state as laid down in our first law. Now there seem to be at least two equally plausible readings of this. Now first, some emphasize the claim that something persists in the same state as laid down in our first law. This would mean that the third law attributes powers to body uh, based upon the fact that the first law attributes tendency to them. And as scholars such as Daniel Garber uh, argue, the first law grounds tendency in God's action. Bodies tend to persist in their states because God is the sort of being who causes them to persist in their states. The problem with this view though, potentially, is that it has difficulty explaining uh, why it is that Descartes would then go ahead and attribute force, power, and action to bodies in sort of a commonsensical way. Now, the second view emphasizes the line translated as so far as it can in, the Latin, in Latin quantum in est. Scholars in this camp insist that it should be translated according to one of its technical meanings, namely, according to its nature. This reading would imply that tendency is rooted in bodies themselves. 
The problem with this view, though, is that it is hard to square with the fact that Descartes says that the laws of nature themselves are, quote, the secondary causes of changes, changes in motion. In any case, if interpretation is limited to the laws of nature passages alone, either reading seems equally plausible, but either reading also faces some objections. These passages are thus underdetermined. This means that our reading of them must be determined by other aspects of Descartes' philosophy and not vice versa. But, but there's a further reason for bracketing the laws of nature passages, at least with respect to Platt's argument. Because if Platt is correct, then the laws of nature are partially derivative of matter itself. Platt says that the ascriptions of power, tendency, and force are ultimately rooted in the intrinsic property of extension itself. On this view, the intrinsic features of bodies would be prior to the descriptions provided by the laws of nature passages. Thus, we should be able to deduce, at least in part, matter's causality by looking at Descartes' other metaphysical claims and without consulting the laws of nature passages themselves. So in short, we cannot presuppose anything that the laws of nature passages attribute to, uh, attribute to bodies. Causality cannot be derived from ascriptions of power, force, or action in the laws of nature passages. Any interpretation must appeal to something else. Now, the, the best place to look, in my opinion, is Descartes' metaphysical treatment of matter as res extensa. And so to this I turn. So the metaphysics of matter and motion. So what's important about uh, Platt's attributions of force, power, activity, and tendency to matter is what he infers from them. That Cartesian bodies count, quote, as secondary causes of change in motion. We need to determine on metaphysical grounds whether Cartesian matter could be a cause at all. First, we need to be mindful of an important distinction that has hitherto not been emphasized in scholarship, namely the distinction between genuine causes and necessary conditions. Platt's thesis gains plausibility only insofar as this distinction is ignored. Simply put, a cause, or a causal power for that matter, is a per se principle of some effect. By principle, I just mean that it is the source of the effect, and the per se designation simply means that a cause causes in virtue of something intrinsic to it, even though the effect can be extrinsic to it, as in the case of uh, efficient causes. So here's a, a general formulation of this. C is a cause, and if and only if, first, an intrinsic property P of C gives rise to F, F being the effect, and second, uh, C gives rise to F in virtue of P and not in virtue of anything else. Now, a necessary condition, on the other hand, is not a per se principle of an effect, but rather is a condition that must obtain in order for a cause, which is a cause, to act. A classic example of this is the contact case in the Aristotelian physics. Uh, for an agent to act, so say the Aristotelians, contact with the patient was necessary. Now, obviously, the contact itself does not induce the motion in the patient. That is the job of the agent. So what's relevant about this distinction to the present issue is that both causes and necessary conditions are in some way explanatory. To cite a cause of any kind is to pick out that in virtue of which effect, an effect comes about, whereas to cite a necessary condition is to, pick out some condi is to pick out some condition that had to obtain in order for that cause to act. Now, I said that Platt's thesis gains plausibility by ignoring this distinction. His view that bodies are causes has dialectical force only insofar as he distinguishes his view from the alternative, which he says is the view uh, that the motion of bodies is explained solely by God's immutable action in the world. Now, Platt, I think, is obviously right to reject this view. Clearly, God is not the only explanation of motion. But speaking in terms of explanations is too vague, because claiming that matter explains motion is not sufficient to prove that it is a real cause. With the notion of a necessary condition, I will be able to preserve Platt's insight that matter is an explanation without making the problematic metaphysical claim that it, that it is a cause. So next, I'll actually get on to my argument that matter cannot be a cause. Now, when considering whether matter can be a cause or not, we need to be precise about the kind of effect that we are talking about. In this case, changes in material modifications. The modifications in question are divisions within matter, the rearrangement of parts, the separation of parts from one another, and changes in motion. In other words, these are all modes of extension. Given that we are discussing the causes of changes in modifications, we need to tweak our definition of causality. So a cause of modal change. C causes a modal change if, if and only if, first, some entity E has mode M1 at time T1 and mode M2 at time T2, and second, C is the cause of, M, of uh, the second mode at T2. And obviously, uh, M1 and M2 designate modes, and uh, the entity E is extension. 
So we are determining whether matter can be this sort of cause. So next we need a, need a criterion to determine whether a purported cause really is a cause. That is whether it actually uh, is able to live up to this definition. I propose what I call the principle of necessitation. It seems that causality, at least in the case of a non-free cause, which is what matter would be if it were to be a cause, entails the necessity of an effect. Non-free causes act whenever external conditions allow for action. So from the vantage point of the effect, this means that the effect must come about whenever the non-free cause exists and it exists under the right conditions. Now, just a quick note uh, to disambiguate here. Uh, we shouldn't confuse what I'm calling necessitation with that prior notion of a, of a necessary condition of action. I'm offering necessitation as a criterion that something must meet in order to count as a cause, whereas a necessary condition on the other hand would be some sort of circumstance external to the cause which must obtain for the cause to act. So just to keep those uh, two things separated. So it seems to me that the necessitation principle is entailed by causality, at least uh, non-free causality, because it seems that non-free causes necessitate their, eff their effects. So long as external conditions allow, and as long as nothing is blocking the cause, if the non-free source of causality is present to something upon which it can act, it will act. Thus, the existence of the effect is necessary with respect to the cause. So if something is a non-free cause, then it does necessitate the effect. Cartesian matter cannot be a cause of modal change because matter cannot satisfy the criterion of necessitation. It fails to satisfy necessitation because there is no necessary link between material states. This is to say, no particular material modification is necessarily related either to the essence of matter itself or to any other particular material mode. Now in terms of Descartes' material ontology, a necessary relation would have to take one of uh, the two following forms. Either some mode M as an effect would be necessarily related to res extensa itself, or that mode M as the effect would be necessarily related to some mode M prime as its cause. But neither relation is provided by Descartes' theory of matter. So here, the, the first case I will argue doesn't hold. Res extensa gives rise to no necessary modifications. This is indicated by the fact that matter remains matter regardless of the way that it is modified. Now, uh, the principles part two, section 23, corroborates this in the case of motion and determinations in size or shape. The section explains that differentiations are introduced into matter by motion itself. And then Descartes is explicit that motion is then super added to matter by God's direct impulse. So this is to say, intrinsically, matter has no differentiations. It only receives them once motion is introduced and God super adds motion. So at least to me, it seems that matter has no necessary modifications. Likewise, no material mode is necessitated by another material mode. Since this point is more difficult to prove, I will make a few passes at it. So first, there's an argument from res extensa's alleged passivity. Matter is defined in passive terms, at least so many scholars argue. Extension is arrangeable, divisible, movable. Taken on its own, this suggests to some that material modes are defined by how they can be changed rather than how they can lead to change. Now, obviously some scholars object to this understanding of passivity as being sort of uh, question begging and relying more upon uh, prior intuitions that one might have about Descartes project. So to avoid that objection, um, I'm gonna consider the issue slightly differently. So the second approach uh, is to show that Descartes does not establish necessary relations between modes. And here I wanna look at um, the case of locomotion, which Descartes explains uh, in part two of the Principia in section 25. Descartes defines locomotion as the transfer of one part of matter or one body from the vicinity of those bodies that are immediate, in immediate contact with it into the vicinity of others. And what is interesting is that the definition disconnects modal change from any cause. Descartes explicitly defines locomotion without reference to either the force or the action that transfers the body from one vicinity to the next. So this means that some new material mode M so some change in modification can be defined independently of the material modes of other bodies which preceded it, i.e. independently from the material states which would have to cause it if material modes necessitated other modes. The reason why no cause is included in the definition, I would argue, is that no material modes in fact cause the, the modal change. 
For if a change in motion depended upon material modifications as its cause, then the definition of locomotion would have to be in terms of those previous modifications. Now, obviously, I'll be met with a number of uh, objections on these claims. So first, it might seem to some that motion, in, in fact, does depend upon matter. For once motion is introduced, it modifies the matter, and as a modification, it requires matter in some way for its continuation. And, it, and in a way, this is right. Modes do sort of definitionally uh, depend upon uh, their substances. But Descartes is clear that God is the one who's actively conserving the total quantity of motion once it is introduced, just in the same way that he conserves the existence of matter. And so it seems that God's action causes motion's preservation then. Furthermore, the nature of extension does not determine how any motion continues once it is conserved. Matter is defined in terms of movability, that is in the terms of the reception. It isn't defined in terms of how it may determine the motion. Now again, someone might reply to this, well, the principle of inertia seems to determine how motion is preserved. And inertia, one would think, derives from the, nation, the nature of body. For the first law states that matter retains whatever modification it has unless acted upon. And the second law states that if its mode is motion, then it preserves its motion in the simplest manner possible. That is through constant rectilinear motion. This means that left to itself, a moving body continues in a rectilinear path whenever it has speed. The problem with this argument is that it appeals to the content of the laws of nature. My point in this section has been to show that the laws of nature passages actually add information to our understanding of the properties of bodies. Based solely on Descartes' metaphysical account of matter, that is apart from any regularity attributed by a law, we wouldn't know how bodies would behave. There are no necessary connections being drawn between the modal states by Descartes. And this is a problem if you think that the intrinsic properties of matter cause change in a body's modifications. So now if, if those few ways of arguing didn't work, I offer a final way. And this is to think about um, modes in terms of a few uh, thought experiments. And these are the assumptions that I wanna begin with. We cannot appeal to the laws of nature passages, but we only presuppose the existence of real extension and God's preservation uh, of extension and whatever uh, total quantity of motion is in matter. Would material modifications necessitate any changes in other modifications under these conditions? So here's the first thought experiment. Do we know how motion would be preserved in a singular body that receives it? So say we have body X with speed S moving away from place A and towards place B. It doesn't seem that either the nature of res extensa alone or the fact that X has speed S tells us how X's speed is preserved once X arrives at place B. At the very least, it does not seem to be a contradiction to suppose that once X arrives at place B, it suddenly decelerates without anything obstructing it. Now someone might object, well, isn't God preserving the motion? Well, yes, he is. But prior to laying out the three laws of nature, beginning at uh, part two of the principle of section 37, Descartes only tells us that God conserves the total quantity of motion in the universe. Before he actually spells out the laws of nature themselves, we are not told specifically how motion would be preserved when there are particular changes in particular motions. Conceivably in this thought experiment, body X could get to point B, suddenly decelerate without colliding into anything or without meeting any opposition, and then body R located at some distant point C could suddenly start moving. On this scenario, God would preserve the total quantity of motion, but there would be no physical connection necessarily between body X and body R. And so we would thus not violate any of Descartes' metaphysical principles. And this, at least I hope to show, is trying to reinforce my overall point that the laws of nature are needed to spell out how the particular changes occur because neither the nature of res extensa alone nor any given mode is sufficient. That is to say, neither necessitates the particular changes. As a, thecond, as a second thought experiment, could we know how bodies would determine each other apart from the laws? Without appealing to the third law of motion, which governs collision, we can actually say quite a bit here. We know that there would be collisions since Descartes' physical world is a plenum. And we also know that it is impossible for two bodies to jointly occupy the same place. Descartes uh, insists that bodies can share a boundary, but they can't actually overlap. So returning to the thought experiment, this means that if body X with speed S is moving towards place B, and if another body, Y, were located at place B, then one of the bodies would have to, so to speak, give way to the other. Because it is metaphysically impossible for two real bodies to jointly occupy the same place, wouldn't this mean that one body actually shoves the other, causing it to move? That is, wouldn't this be a clear case of causality? 
And wouldn't this actually mean that the, necessita the necessitation criterion is met because the, the modes of the bodies necessitate the avoidance of joint location? Well, I actually don't think that it, they would. The problem is that neither the nature of res extensa nor the particular modifications of the bodies can determine how precisely this avoidance work. They don't necessitate any particular way of avoiding the joint location. Because just on the metaphysical definition of res extensa, it is still logically consistent, at least as far as I can tell, to think that body X simply halts once it reaches body Y and that God finds some different body, say body Z, to receive the motion which body X had. So it seems that the modes of a body do not necessitate the modes in another, at least based simply on the nature of res extensa or on the, uh, the specific qualities of the modes. So as a final piece of evidence, if maybe my reading of the principles wasn't convincing, um, I wanna to turn to some, uh, some of the correspondences that Descartes has in the immediate sort of nine year window around the publication of the Principia. In letters to Moore in 1649, and then in Regius in 1641, it seems that Descartes actually rules out causal powers uh, or causality itself from res extensa. In his August 1649 letter to Moore, Descartes writes concerning the causes of motion, quote, the translation which I call motion is a thing of no less reality than shape. It is a mode in a body. The power of causing motion may be the power of God himself conserving the same amount of translation in matter as he put in it in the first moment of his creation, or it may be the power of a created substance like our soul or of any other thing to which he gave the power to move a body. So clearly Descartes is not only talking about the first instance in which God super adds motion to matter, but he, he seems to include other instances in which motion is caused or changes in motion are caused in particular bodies. And he singles out God's power, the mind's power, and then any other thing which God gave the power to move a body. Now scholars like Della Rocca have argued that the open-ended nature of this list is compatible with bodies having the power to move other bodies. And taken on the basis of this letter alone, De La Roca is not wrong. However, in one of the previous letters which Descartes wrote to Moore on the 5th of February of that year, he actually provides what seems to be his complete list of the entities which have the power to move a body. And they include God, the mind, and then angels. And this suggests that the list of causal powers of bodily motion is limited to God, mind, and to angels. Now I grant that these passages, the passages are still technically consistent with the view that bodies are active powers. But if this were to be Descartes' view, two things would have to be explained. First, why doesn't Descartes actually include matter on this list of powers to more? And second, why does Descartes seem to connect motive power to immateriality? It at least seems to me somewhat harder to explain these points than to simply accept that res extensa is not conceived by Descartes as a causal power. The second uh, correspondence is from a letter to Regius in uh, 1641. So around the time that he's actually writing the meditations and here Descartes reduces the body's motive and nutritive functions to the mere motions of parts. Now, interestingly, he then denies that we can name these functions as little souls. And this is what Regius was trying to do. He was trying to sort of assert one view of an Aristotelian faculty psychology in which each faculty was a soul. And the reason he gives is that internal and external motions of a body are not the first principles of a person's action. He said, instead, the will is a principle of action. And so it seems that Descartes is aware of the notion of a principle being the Aristotelian term for a source of motion, which is another word for a causal power. And it seems that if he's rejecting that a mechanized body is a source of motion, it's because he thinks that res extensa is not a power. All right, so based on these passages from Descartes, I hope to have successfully argued the following points. One, based on the principles, matter cannot necessitate any change in matter. Res extensa thus cannot satisfy our criterion of causality and so cannot be a cause. Two, other important passages from Descartes' correspondences likewise seem to, seem to deny that matter is a causal power. And just briefly in conclusion, I want to provide an alternative to Platt's thesis. Bodies may not be causes, but we can still recognize that they are physically, physically explanatory if we view them as necessary conditions according to that first definition I gave. As the laws of nature passages insist, prior modifications of a body determine which later modifications it will have. If we, consider that, if we consider this maybe in some sort of general form, the laws would thus state, if X obtains, then Y follows. For instance, if a body is at rest and nothing interferes with it, then it remains at rest. 
bodies, as we've seen, cannot cause this change. Instead, they fulfill the antecedent conditions of these general laws. They should thus be viewed as necessary conditions for the applications of the laws of nature. In particular, their various modifications would be the uh, uh, fulfilling conditions. So in short, bodies are not causes, but they are necessary conditions for the laws to operate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, time for questions. So please do um, signal in the chat if you have questions or you know, raise your hand or something. Who wants to begin? Dan? You need to turn on your mic then. Why don't you let Ed go first? Because my okay, Ed. predictable. Uh, hi, Nicholas. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with your main conclusions. I don't know about the necessity of matter and all that stuff. One of the things I was going to suggest, and I, I've just come to, it's come to dawn on me that how to read this set discussion over many years. In my earlier years, when I was sort of under this way of trying to see Descartes as a relationist, I, I saw this passage as kind of conflating dynamics and kinematics, but there's that passage in the um, one of the letters to Moore where Moore presses him on the idea of, does the wind blow through the tower or does the tower move through stationary wind? And Descartes responds by giving a totally different example of, two, of a guy in a boat and a guy on the shore pushing at one another. And Descartes says that the push is as much in the guy on the shore as in the guy in the boat. And I think that's more or less trying to, and I come to see that passage, I think more as is that there's nothing in a in a in one body giving a property to the other, right? So just as you could say the property of the guy pushing on the shore went to the guy in the boat, you could say it the other way around. In other words, don't think of of the cause of motion as a transfer of a property from one to the other. I think that's sort of you know sort of in, in consistent with the kind of the line you're kind of pushing. Um, like I said, usually people see this as well. It's kind of giving a different example. He's conflating aspects of the explanation here. But if you see it as so much of Descartes' notion of transfer of motion as the action rather than something given given to the body, that all makes a lot more sense. I mean, so in other words, I think this that example kind of upholds the view that there's nothing in matter that's transferred from one body to the other. It's all just transfer, right? But anyways, that's my little comment. Yeah, thank you. Do you know which which particular letter that was? Um, that I'm not sure, and I'll have to go back and look at it. Unfortunately, it's not in the Cunningham translation. Um, so, but it's I think it might be the second or the third one where the, the letters get pro get progressively longer. It's in some of my recent stuff, like in the book from 2016. I have that passage in there, and a couple others. Um, uh, who else talks about it? Shea uh, comments on that in his nice book on um, on Descartes' physics. And um, uh, a couple of other people, maybe Gabby talks about it at one point, but it is, I think, I think it's relevant to the point, right? Because he's basically saying, don't think of motion as a transfer of a property. I think that's the proper way to read that example. Um, um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's something that, that is different than that, right? It's, you know, and so I think he's criticizing the old sort of uh, medieval conception. I forget the names now of these things where, where motion is, is a property gained by an object um, different from, impetus as burden would say it, but similar. But anyways, I'm gonna hog the um, Is it my turn? Well, don't we want Nicol don't we want to let Nicolas to answer or say something? I, I don't really have anything else to add to that. I just need to do some more digging myself. Okay, I can okay then that is it's your turn. There is a comment like that in, in one of the letters um, um, from Descartes to Moore, where he does say something like, um, I, and I can't find it off the top of my head, and it is in Cottingham, where he does say something like, um, you know, motion is not a quantity that's transferred from, from um, uh, one body to another, though he doesn't, he doesn't use the particular example that um, that you um, um, that you cite, um, Ed. But I mean, the point that I was going to um, do, the comment that I was going to make is, um, it seems to me one of one, one of the um, arguments that seems to me most convincing 
for the idea that um, um, bodies don't have um, the force to actually cause changes in other bodies is, and that is, is, is the fact that um, um, bodies are just the objects of geometry made real. They are just, they really just have um, 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 the geometrical properties. And if that's all bodies are, then it doesn't seem to me that there is anything in them that could possibly be the ground of um, force. Um, I mean, the, the word that, and, and, and that Descartes uses in um, Principles 243 is weis, force. And um, there just can't be anything in bodies that, that could possibly ground that. There is an elaborate um, um, explanation in Geru that's taken up by Alan Gabby, that's then taken up by uh, uh, Ted Schmaltz to try to figure out some way or another of getting around that. But I, I really don't see any, I, that for me is sufficient to, um, 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 to question the view that bodies have the real power, force, ability to um, actually change properties in another body. I completely agree with you. Uh, in many ways, your book, um, the Descartes Metaphysical Physics and Dennis Duchenne's uh, Physiologia, I, I think are just sort of like the final word on these points. And I see a lot of scholarship is trying Thank to find you. several- I, I sort of think so too, but, <laughs> but <laughs> not everybody feel... agrees. I mean, we are trying to create, you know, a publishing mill, whatever. Uh, we need jobs apparently. But I see a lot of attempts from about 1999 Till about, well, I guess with the 2020 book to try to be ways of getting around your argument. And so I'm just trying to defend the old view. So I was convinced by your argument. I'm trying to find clever ways of supporting it even further. Garou was actually before that. Garou, I think. Oh, was, yeah, 89. But that view makes no sense. I to think me. by 89, Garou was dead. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I think that was when one of his essays was translated in the, right. uh, the Harvester Press. No. Right. Right, so uh, yeah, there is a uh, there is a reference, Nicolas, for you in the in the chat from Hanok Benyami, letter to Mar, fifth of March, sixteen forty nine, and a page from from AT. Uh, are there any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Hanok, do you want to say something? No. Okay. Then, um, well, if there are no more questions. Perhaps something, um, if, if there are no more questions, it's not uh, really a, a question. It's, um, you know, uh, Pascal understood the, the card as uh, saying that uh, once uh, God gave the push, then he can uh, ignore everything else, perhaps just sustain everything in existence. So uh, this, you, you take uh, this way in which uh, the card was introduced, uh, understood by the French uh, philosophers um, of his time and immediately following him as uh, uh, mistaken, right? Yes, I actually think um, he maintains something of the medieval view that God is both the creative cause and the conserving cause, those being uh, identical in act, just temporally different. And uh, why, why was he misunderstood uh, by Pascal and others? And actually a, a question, uh, a, a real question here. Um, so if it's a misunderstanding, was he defended against uh, Pascal's uh, objections by some uh, Cartesians of the time, according to your uh, uh, principles? So when it comes to the physics, not the uh, the philosophy of the mind, but when it comes to the physics, I think um, Malebranche's response is sufficient. I think he recognizes that the action which is uh, given to motion has to be maintained in the same way that, sorry, the action which is given to matter has to be maintained in the same way that the matter itself does. That's my humble opinion. So, so this can uh, 
provide support to your interpretation because uh, if uh, Descartes continues medieval thought in this respect, others of the time should have been uh, familiar with, uh, with that and indeed uh, follow this uh, line versus uh, Pascal's objections uh, in the face of Pascal's objections. I think uh, if you can make use of that, this is a nice support. Thank you. Right, so, uh, and this brings us to, to closing this first, uh, uh, the discussion after the first paper. Let's thank Nicolas. We will thank everyone at the end, but now is the moment. And um, let's move to the next uh, talk. So our next talk for tonight is uh, by Andreas Hüttemann from the University of Köln on the relevance of God's immutability for Descartes' derivation of the laws of nature, of the laws of motion. Andreas, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, work in progress. Uh, I'll share the screen. Okay, here we go. So on the relevance of God's immutability for, God's, uh, for Descartes' uh, derivation of the laws of motion, um, clearly, there is some relevance um, in, uh, in the principles 2, 36, 37. He says things such as merely by regular concurrence, he, God, preserves the same amount of motion and rest in the material universe as he put there in the beginning. For we understand that God's perfection involves not only his being immutable in himself, but also his operating in a manner that is utterly constant and immutable. And he then goes on. Uh, you all know these passages from God's immutability. We can also know certain rules or laws of nature, which are the secondary and particular causes of the various motions we see in particular bodies. But what exactly is the relevance of God's immutability for the Cartesian laws? Um, God's immutability is on the one hand relevant for the metaphysics of laws and for and, but, and on the other hand, uh, for the epistemology of laws. That's a distinction Mary Domsky has drawn. Metaphysical questions concern the metaphysical underpinnings of laws. How exactly do the laws metaphysically depend on or are grounded in God's immutability? How are we to understand God's concurrence? Such questions are discussed in uh, Professor Garber's book, chapter nine. Is God acting immutably part of God's essence and are the laws thus simply a facet of God, as Psylos has it. In what follows, I will assume that the laws are metaphysically grounded in God or in God's attributes, but I will not have much to say about this dependence in any detail. I would rather focus on the epistemology uh, um, of laws and the question of how God's immutability is relevant for this epistemology. So the question is, what is the role the immutability of God plays for the identification of the laws, for how we uh, come to know the laws? And I want to distinguish two aspects. Uh, first, there's the normative or methodological question of how, according to the Descartes, one ought to proceed in order to identify or establish the laws of nature. And then there is uh, the question of how Descartes did, in fact, proceed. Of course, the metaphysical and the epistemological issue might be connected. If we know how the laws are grounded in God's immutability, that may serve as the basis for the determination of what the laws are. But if we, if we are not so sure about uh, the metaphysics, then even though uh, certain metaphysical claims might be true, they don't help us uh, with, sort of, uh, they don't help a natural philosopher to determine what the laws are. Okay. So I start with the standard view, which is, of course, then the view that I will uh, criticize. <laughs> um, so the standard view, uh, the, the thing I call the standard view is concerned with epistemological questions. As is clear from the arguments above, Descartes deduces the necessary and law-like way that God maintains the motion of material bodies that he has created through rational considerations of God's existence as an immutable being. Or, uh, God reveals an attribute, his immutability, from which we can infer the, from the natural light that bodies must satisfy certain laws. That's uh, Professor Gaber. 
Laws are imminent, they directly follow from God's immutability. So that might, uh, the, the follow might be metaphysical, but it might also be epistemological. And uh, Margaret Osler in an older paper, because these laws follow directly from God's immutability, they are necessarily true and we can know them in an a priori demonstrative manner. So the standard view is a view about how we can arrive at the knowledge of laws, the view that the laws can be deduced a priori from God's immutability. More precisely, I use the term for the conjunction of the following claims. In methodological respects, Descartes holds that an appeal to God's immutability suffices for the derivation of laws, and that Descartes, as a matter of fact, in establishing these laws, derives them directly and exclusively from God's immutability. The standard view may indeed be the view Descartes advocates in the world or that he sort of, that captures what's going on in the world. He says things like, these two rules follow manifestly from the mere fact that God is immutable and that acting always in the same way, he always produces the same effect. And then a little later, we must necessarily think that God causes them to continue always doing so and so on. But I will argue the standard view does not adequately capture what's going on in the principles. So, okay, let me start by asking the question, why is there change at all in the universe? If God is immutable and the characteristics of the universe are to be explained in terms of and thus characterized from his, this immutability, why is there change at all uh, given God's immutability? So that's a question that has been asked before. Um, and as a fact, uh, Descartes is aware of this concern. Um, in uh, 42, while trying to establish part of the rules for the collision, he concludes in the Latin edition, the very fact that creation is in continual state of change is thus evidence for the immutability of God. And he, in the French version, it says, the very fact that creation is in a continual state of change is in no way incompatible with the immutability of God and may even serve to be evidence uh, to establish it. So somebody seems to have pointed him uh, uh, to, to this fact. Is, isn't this uh, incompatible in some way? But, but of course he denies it. Uh, but, and, and what are the reasons for thinking that there is no tension between God's acting immutably and a non-static universe? In uh, 42, uh, Descartes, un Descartes understands God's immutability, at least partly in terms of immutable laws. God preserves the world by the self-same action and in accordance with the self-same laws as when he created it. Thus, part of what Descartes says is that God's immutability is compatible with a non-static universe because the laws do not change over time. And thus, from God's attribute of immutability, it follows that the laws are immutable. That's a metaphysical issue. Furthermore, we can deduce the immutability of laws once we know about God's immutability. Uh, that's sort of an epistemological claim. Knowing God's attribute of immutability is sufficient to derive the immutability of laws. That all fits with a standard view um, and is fine on the standard view. However, um, even though the immutability is an important feature of laws, it leaves completely open what the laws say. say. God's immutability, if considered only in this respect, is compatible with any set of laws whatsoever, uh, provided the laws are unchanging. As it stands, God's immutability thus wouldn't determine the content of the laws at all. So we have to distinguish the content of the laws from the fact that the laws are immutable. And clearly, um, in several places, Descartes indicates that the immutability of God is meant to be relevant for the content of the laws too. By appeal to God's immutability, we are supposed to be able to determine the content of the laws. But how, does, how exactly does that work? Okay, and here, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, methodology. Um, how should we understand the relevance of God's immutability for the identification of the content of the laws? Can we derive rules of collision from what we know about God's attributes? If there is change in the world, arguing from the attribute of immutability to the content is not quite say, straight, uh, so straightforward. And as a matter of fact, Descartes in the principles 
does not suggest that this is how we should proceed. Instead, Descartes proposes a different and less ambitious procedure. The appeal to immutability turns out to be an important part of a methodological prescription Descartes advances. And um, here we go, you probably all know this, for we understand that God's perfection involves not only his being immutable in himself, but also his operating in a manner that is always utterly consonant and immutable. Now there are some changes whose occurrence is guaranteed either by our own plain experience or by divine revelation. And either our perception of our faith shows us that these take place without any change in the creator. But apart from these, we should not suppose that any other changes occur in God's work, in case this suggests some inconstancy in God. So there are two things to note. First, God, uh, Descartes uses God's immutability and his acting immutable not in order to directly argue for a law of motion or the principle of the conservation of motion, but rather to argue for a methodological principle. We should not suppose that any other changes occur in God's works. And second, there is even an explicit role for experience when it comes to the identification of laws. Descartes specified uh, the exact role of the appeal to God's attributes and to experience elsewhere in the principles. Uh, paragraph 28 of the first part, when dealing with natural things, we will then never derive any explanations from the purposes which God or nature may have had in view when creating them. For we should not be so arrogant as to suppose that we can share in God's plans. We should instead consider him as the efficient cause of all things. And starting from the divine attributes, which by God's will we have some knowledge of, we shall see with the aid of our God-given natural light, what conclusion should be drawn concerning those effects which are apparent to our senses. Two points. Descartes is concerned with the explanation of empirical phenomena effects which are apparent to our senses, and the explanandum is an empirical phenomena which may even be a contingent phenomena. And going back to uh, part two, paragraph 36, where he says we should su not suppose any other changes, uh, this passage indicates we could in principle advance different suppositions as explanations for the changes we observe. The appeal to immutability occurs in order to narrow down otherwise admissible explanations. So Descartes suggests that we should single out that hypothesis or conclusion that takes into account what we know about God's attributes. The rationale for this is that God is the efficient cause of natural things. So the appeal to God's attribute of immutability is not the starting point of an a priori derivation, but rather serves as the criterion to single out in slightly anachronistic terms the best explanation of an empirical phenomenon. Okay, so much for the methodology. Uh, and now I try to argue uh, that Descartes does in fact proceed according to this principle. First, uh, I first want to look at the conservation principle. According to the conservation principle, God preserves the same amount of motion and rest in the material universe as he put there in the beginning. Um, how does Descartes argue for this claim? Admittedly, he says, motion is simply a mode of the matter which is moved, but nevertheless, it has a certain determinate quantity, and this we easily understand may, may be constant in the universe as a whole while varying in any given part. So in the Latin, uh, it says something like esse posse or something. I can read that to you uh, later. So what we have is a plain experience for at least some parts of matter. It is true that they not only move, but their quantity of motion changes over time. And we have possible hypotheses compatible, compatible with this observation. The quantity of motion in the universe is constant. The quantity of motion in the universe is constantly increases, constantly decreases. The quantity of motion of the universe oscillates between two values and so on. Lots of hypotheses. Um, and the hypothesis advanced is one among several other hypotheses, as we have just seen, which are all compatible with the phenomenon. Descartes singles out uh, the hypothesis that the quantity of motion is constant because it best fits his methodological rule, according to which we should not assume additional changes in the world that are not dictated by plain experiences. 
The best explanation of the plane experience that we have is the one that best acknowledges the assumption that the efficient cause of the universe is an immutable being. It is this methodological rule that supports the hypothesis of the conservation of motion. So the conservation of the quantity of motion is introduced as a postulate in the context of explaining certain experiences, namely that bodies move and change with respect to their quantity of motion. The derivation of the law is not simply a derivation from God's immutability, but due to an evaluation of various hypotheses in the light of plain experiences concerning the motion of matter on the one hand and the attributes of God as the ultimate efficient cause on the other. Okay. And I'm much too fast, sorry. Uh, you only get 15 minutes from me. Uh, so uh, first and the second law, what is, uh, what is the empirical phenomenon Descartes is concerned with in, in, in these laws? Uh, one thing he comes back to all the time is that many particles are often forcibly deflected by the impact of other bodies. Ultimately, Descartes wants to explain these collisions, and he does that in the third law. In the first and second law, he determines the movements of the bodies that go into these collisions. In accordance with his methodological rule, we should not suppose that any other changes occur in God's works. And taking into account an analogous case, the analogous case of shape, Descartes argues, if it moves, there's equally no reason to think that it loses its motion of its own accord. And there's also a rival hypothesis, one that Descartes discusses. From our earliest years, we have often judged that such motions come to an end on their own accord and without being checked by something else. What's wrong with this rival hypothesis? The problem is not that it cannot account for our plane experiences, i.e. for the fact that many particles are often forcibly deflected. So what we have, uh, are these two hypotheses that are both compatible with the empirical phenomena. Hypothesis one says roughly such motions come to an end on their own accord. Hypothesis two says what is in motion always so far as it can continues to move. And the methodological rule according uh, that appeals to the attributes of God as the, <clears throat> as the uh, efficient cause favors hypothesis two. We shouldn't assume sort of additional uh, changes. Um, and hence, we must conclude that what is in motion always so far as it can continues to move. So I think, okay. My conclusion, when we move from the world to the principles with respect to the question of how to establish the laws of motion, we can diagnose a shift from the standard view to a more interesting and more nuanced view. In the world, he says things like, we must necessarily think that God causes them to continue always doing so. And, but even if everything our senses ever experienced in the world uh, seemed manifestly contrary to these two rules, the reasoning which has taught them to me seems so strong that I cannot help believing myself obliged to posit them. And in the principles, as we have seen, uh, he acknowledges that there are some changes whose occurrence is guaranteed by our plain experience. But apart from these, we should not suppose that any other changes occur in God's works. So the derivation uh, is no longer a priori and necessary, as he probably uh, thought of in uh, the world. Okay, I think that was it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh... Thank you for keeping the time so well. So yeah, we well, I didn't keep the time well. I just gave you not enough uh, paper <laughs> we have for the money. Time for questions now, and I'm sure there will be uh, questions. Or uh, maybe you want to stop sharing so that we. Oh yeah, see yeah, sure. Better. Right. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So, who wants to begin? Then. Again, you need to turn on the mic. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much for an interesting um, and unusual interpretation um, of the derivation of the laws. Um, the way, as I understand it, your um, 
you're arguing is that um, the appeal to divine um, um, immutability is part of an explanation of our experiences. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and the standard view that you're um, that you are um, um, opposing is the idea that uh, from the immutability of God, the laws of nature necessarily follow. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that curious passage in um, Principles Part 2, Section 36, where he does um, uh, talk about, except for divine revelation and, um, except for divine revelation and, um, um, Evident experience, etc. How do you read the? How do you read that? I I, I have, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think he came to ignore. I mean, I, I must say that I have no idea what uh, what he has to say about uh, divine revelation or why he says this at this uh, uh, at this point. But I think uh, he uh, comes to acknowledge that. Uh, that there are certain, uh, so in, in, in today's um, philosophy, this is sometimes called a Murian fact, right? There are certain plain experiences and they are very simple. It's not experiments. Um, um, and, and, and as far as I can see, it's things like uh, bodies collide, uh, bodies uh, change the, uh, the quantity of motion they have, that kind of thing. And um, that's sort of uh, that's sort of the experiences um, that uh, he now thinks he has to explain. Here's another here's another reading, and this is mm -hmm. what I think is going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, that he does. I still think the standard view is well, here. Let's suppose the standard view is right, mm -hmm. um, and that he really isn't attempting to derive the um, um, law here and the, the conservation of um, quantity of motion um, from divine immutability. There are, I think he would say, some obvious um, um, exceptions to that. Those obvious uh, uh, exceptions, I think, are um, the divine revelation would refer to miracles. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which might cause violations in the mm -hmm. uh, um, um, conservation of quality. Yeah. Um, the other one, the evident experience, is going to be mind-body interaction. The fact that the mind can actually cause a change mm -hmm. in, um, um, uh, in the motion of a body. So those, by experience in divine revelation, are going to be what appear to be exceptions. So he's in a certain sense putting those aside. And I think what, for, for me, this is evidence of the fact that um, for Descartes, the laws of nation, the laws of, the law of conservation of uh, quantity of motion is not intended to be inviolable. There are violations mm -hmm. because there are other, okay. well, first of all, revelation there might be reasons for um, 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 miracles. And in case of mind-body interaction, the mind is itself a cause, can be a cause of motion in the world, just in the way God can be a, a, a cause of motion in the world. As he says, for example, in, uh, I think it's the 1648 letter to Arnaud, where he says, you know, we know by evident experience that the mind can actually cause changes in uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I see that. Yeah. He, um, okay. But uh, th there's this uh, in this passage. He also he says that um, um, sort of uh, the quantity of motion may be constant. So that's sort of one option that we can put forward. So uh, if if it if the conservation of um, motion would have would be sort of a would be uh, if there would be an a priori derivation of the conservation of motion from the immutability 
then uh, he should say that it follows that um, that it follows that uh, uh, that the quantity of motion is conserved, but he puts it forward as um, one possible hypothesis that's compatible with the change that's going on in the world. Um, yeah. I mean that's an interesting. I'm 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 looking at that passage right now, and I must admit I had never I had never noticed that uh, Posse could mm -hmm. be there before and never thought about that. But another way of reading that would be, uh, we can easily understand that the motion. I'm now reading 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 in the Latin that the we can, it can easily be understood that the total. Um, 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 that that the um, um, quantity of motion can remain the same in the whole universe can remain the same even though the single parts are moved, the individual parts are moved, which can be mm -hmm. saying not that um, it's possible. Here is a hypothesis: mm -hmm. that quantity of motion is remaining the same, but rather it's possible for it to remain the same even though. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, yeah, thank you. Yeah. The Quamwis. I have a kind of follow-up here. Yeah. I have a, a kind of follow-up on this point, uh, which is a kind of more general question as to, well, actually two questions, as to what would be the opponent view, contextually speaking, that Descartes is arguing against. Because, okay, I always thought, as most of us do here, that this is about Descartes' physics, but of course Descartes was arguing um, against some other views. And what are the alternative views? Um, and and uh, in connection with that, uh, is there any temporal dimension to be taken into account? Because one alternative view would be the view according to which the laws of nature are not immutable. They vary according mm -hmm. to the history of the universe. You know, before the fall, there were different laws. Before the Babel episode, there are still different laws. We are living in a period in which the laws are such and such. And this affects also the regularities in the phenomena, phenomenal world. So we might, I mean, I'm, I might, we might think that maybe Descartes argues against this view mm. well, with this I, passage. Yeah. Uh, why, why do, do, do you, I mean, sort of, I'm not arguing uh, against uh, 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 the view that Descartes holds that the laws are immutable. No, no, no. Uh, I, I know. I know. Neither do I. What I'm asking is whether it would be illuminating for us to understand mm. further these details of Descartes' passages if we look into a larger contextual perspective mm. to what kind of arguments is Descartes replying? Yeah. What I've, are the alternative yeah. views? And whether this, this view or, or simply taking into account a temporal dimension of uh, an evolutionary universe would be relevant for your argument. Yeah. That's all yeah. I said. Yeah, yeah I, I thought of it more like uh, sort of uh, um, a dynamic that has taken place because maybe he has discussed his views that he propounded in the um, in, in the world to be sort of problematic in certain respects. For example, that there is change, and uh, he then came to think about the way he derived uh, the laws. Uh, sort of, uh, he came to a methodologically more nuanced uh, picture. So I hadn't thought of it as a, a, as a reaction to uh, other people, more than as a reaction to uh, uh, comments he might have uh, gotten um, on on earlier thoughts. But we have uh, two more questions, uh, and if you keep them short, then we might uh, we might put them both on the table. So Nicolas Westberg and then Michael Jakovic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your paper. Uh, so are you also suggesting that in the shift from the, the world to the principles, uh, Descartes has given up his aim of creating a lasting, uh, a lasting science? 
it seems that with the introduction introduction of this methodological principle, now science uh, depends upon hypotheses, which seems to mm-hmm. which seem to be contingent. Yeah, that's um, that's actually something I thought about because I mean he acknowledges plain experiences, and even uh, even if these plain experiences would uh, only uh, refer to a mind body interaction, I, I don't see how he can. I mean, he doesn't have anything to limit plain experiences to just these uh, items that we th- that he might think of as paradigmatic. So there might be other plain experiences, and uh, then uh, then he should allow um, his uh, laws to be fallible. But but that's certainly not something that he uh, embraces. But it, I mean, it it may. I mean, the, the, there are certain things in his views which are sort of uh, implicit, but which uh, uh, which might be implicit, but which he hasn't thought out. So I, I don't think that he anywhere uh, uh, says something along these lines. But it's actually a question I had when I prepared the talk: whether there is any limit on the um, on the evident experiences that he mentions there. Thank you. Yeah, Michael. Hi, Andres. I'd like to talk. Hi, Michael. Um, so actually, uh, the text for my question, Professor Doxy has penned it in the chat. And so I was going to ah. ask about that. Um, how does your, so, uh, so like after he gives the seven collision rules, he says, uh, I mean, in the Latin he says, they're self-evident. And then in the French edition, which is in brackets. Ah, OK. Uh, they're so self, so certain that even if experience shows us the opposite, we should still be obliged. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, I guess it was just like, how does your reading fit with that? And I mean, for the contextual context of this kind of, even if the census tells us the opposite, we should trust, you know, reason about this. I think. Well, I don't. Let me just let me just say, what do you want to say about that passage? Uh, okay. Um, I thought he only says this in the world. I have to admit. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I guess I have to look at that. That's a serious objection, of course. I see. Uh, I once uh, went to a talk by engineers who got a serious question, and they didn't say, "I don't know what to say at the moment." Uh, uh, she said, "It's research." <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you also to Professor Duck. She. I guess it's. I have to look at this. Um, okay. Uh, okay uh, so that must be somehow compatible with this idea that. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I have to look at it. Thank you. Right, Dennis, do you have to, uh, do you want to add something in one minute or? No, uh, my question has been asked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great, I'm, I'm glad to see how collaboration works. Yeah. <laughs> Minds of the same colors. Uh, right. <laughs> um, then, and then, and let's uh, jo- join me for, uh, in, in thanking Andreas for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, That's very helpful. Thank you for the comments. And let's move uh, to the next speaker tonight, uh, who is Michna Dobre from the University of Bucharest. And the title of Michna's uh, talk is Natural Philosophy and Cartesian Cosmology, Rule and the Popularization of Cartesianism. Michna, you have the floor. Thank you all for being here today. Can you see my screen? Yes, we okay, do. Wonderful. Um, it is a great pleasure to present in the Princeton Bucharest seminar on early modern philosophy. Uh, these are some of the initial results of a research project which I've started last October with my colleagues in Bucharest. The project aims to explore the reception of Cartesian physics in Newtonian context. By choosing the topic of cosmology for this paper, 
I also link the current findings with results from a prior research project on Cartesian cosmology, to which I'll refer during the talk. The paper is structured in the following manner. I begin with a few words about Jacques Rowe. I am sure everyone in the audience who attended the Brand seminar already heard this name. But today, I'll try to make his name more popular among the historians of philosophy and science. Next, I'll move to a brief account of the Cartesian cosmology. I discuss Descartes' cosmological views, and then I introduce roles. The book that sits at the center stage of my talk is the Traité de Physique, printed in French in 1671, but quickly translated into Latin and disseminated across Europe. I'll explain the intricate history of the reception of this treatise, especially in the annotated uh, editions by Antoine Le Grand and Samuel Clark. Finally, if time allows me, I'll sketch some conclusions and I would be happy to hear your comments and suggestions during the Q&A session. I am aware it is late or too early in some parts of the world and who might not be the first early modern figure to think about before the next cup of coffee. So let me put forward the key topics of the paper. I try to take advantage of the online format and to use more visual elements than in a traditional conference. So I'll explore the illustrations from Rowe's cosmology. Then I examine what can we learn from the index of names in the various editions of the treatise. And I shall focus only on the second part of Rowe's treatise. What I want to show today is that such focus on illustrations and names can reveal a lot in terms of stages of composition, not only of the annotations of the treatise, but also of Rowe's text. This claim will become easier to grasp while I, uh, I advance with uh, the slides. Suffice to say that a more complex transmission should follow from here. So, who was Rho? He is often presented as the champion of Cartesianism, mainly due to his family connection with Claude Clercelier, the editor of Descartes' unpublished manuscripts and letters. In 1664, he married one of Clercelier's daughters and he became a well-known defender of Cartesian philosophy. Before that, he was known as a professor of mathematics and he was famous for his experiments, often presented in public conferences in Paris. In the 1660s, he organized the Wednesday conferences at his own house, but he attended other meetings such as Monmouth, among others. He published little. Only two treatises were printed under his name, just one year before his death in 1672. A collection of his mathematical writings was published by Clercelier in 1682 as the Ouvre Posthume. In this talk, I'm interested in the traité and the reception of the book. I examine only the second part of the book, which is dedicated to cosmology. The treatise was usually printed in two volumes, with the first volume covering general natural philosophical topics. The second volume included three other parts of the treatise. The second part on cosmology, the third part on uh, earth and met uh, meteorology, and the first part on medicine. It is easy to make a comparison with Descartes' own principles, such that Rowe's first part of the traité would correspond roughly to the second book of the principles, while Descartes' third book would correspond to the cosmology of part two of Rowe, and so on. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Descartes' cosmology. It was developed in Le Monde and the Principles of Philosophy. The first was left uh, unfinished and in manuscript form, and it was published only in 1664. The Principles were published numerous times in the second half of the 17th century. 
The third book of the principles included Descartes' theory of the vortex. It described the motion of swirling matter on semicircular paths forming systems of interconnected vortices, small or large, without any gap. Descartes' world is a plane without any void space. The image on the screen is the most popular representation of Descartes' vortices, and it was reprinted numerous times in the century. Just to give you a hint for the significance of illustrations in Descartes' philosophy, I provide the example of images included in the third part of the principles. Here you can see the variety of representations, but I should note that the two images of the vortices on the left, which you can see here, uh, were by far the most repeated images of Descartes' cosmology. What you see now is a virtual collection prepared last year together with two of my colleagues from Bucharest. The address of the website is on the screen and we would be very happy to hear your comments. If you are interested in this topic, feel free to explore the online collection. Uh, this is the home page of the website with the title page of the books included in the collection, various editions of the Principia and uh, you know, two editions of Le Monde. But let me get back to Rho. The diagram on the screen should reveal the complex transmission of Rho's treatise. It starts with the publication of the Traité in 1671, which is surprisingly late, as most of the included material was discussed in Rouault's conferences. If you're interested in this topic, I can offer more details in the Q&A. Many early modern reprints of the French version followed, but I would like to draw your attention to the Latin trans the, uh, transmission of the treatise. One branch, of transmission is due to Théophile Bonnet's Latin version, printed in Geneva in 1674. It contributed to the popularity of the book, and from 1682, the treatise was published together with a set of comments by the Cartesian Antoine Le Grand. Later, the text was enlarged with the mechanical treatise from Rose Ouvre Postume. Other editions have included the treatise on perspective too. Of a particular interest for the historians of philosophy and science is the other Latin translation, Samuel Clarke's version of uh, 1697. Not only he translated the text, but he annotated it and altered the notes in subsequent editions. Up to the English translation, prepared by his brother, John Clark, and published in 1723. There is also the curious case of a hybrid version of the uh, treatise with both sets of annotations, Le Grand's and Clark's, but I do not plan to discuss it today. On the screen, you can see the table of contents for the second part of Rowe's treatise on natural philosophy. Part two is divided into a discussion of the traditional cosmology, such that the Ptolemaic system of the world is presented up to chapter 17. Incidentally, the pagination of the English edition makes the distinction more evident, as the second part of Rowe's cosmology begins on a different page, with chapter 17, where he starts to discuss the hypothesis of a, a moving Earth. In terms of content, the treatise is very pedagogical, and after some definitions, Rowe moves to discuss the observed phenomena, which are explained accordingly to one of the available hypotheses. He defines cosmography in, art, uh, in Article 1 of Chapter 1, and he explains the method of study in Article 3, because the parts of the world could have been divided in infinite ways by God, only experience can show the particular way in which the actual division took place. But the general observation characterizing the phenomena of nature presented in chapter two are in need of an explanation 
And this is the role of the third chapter to introduce the two hypotheses available for the explanation, the Ptolemaic and the Copernican ones. The succeeding chapters take the form of uh, testing the consequences of the traditional worldview against a variety of observed phenomena. It is not an upright rejection of the traditional cosmos, but one that goes through the various details of the structure of the universe and the motion of the planets. Sometimes Rho refers to more recent astronomical observations and to the use of the telescope. In his comments, Le Grand usually complements the text with more references to Cassini's recent astronomical observations, some of them unavailable to Rho. In this section, Clark, Clark's comments are rather supportive and sometimes only complement a vague reference. For example, when Rho states in chapter nine, article six, that some observations about the moon are known, Clark puts in the note the precise reference, see Mercator's Astronomia, and other similar examples can be given. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all the details. Chapters uh, 17 to 23 are a defense of the Copernican view with Tycho's system being reduced to Copernicus. In the opening of the 24th chapter, Rome makes the methodological observation that while a multitude of hypotheses is not a problem for the natural philosopher, only one can be true and proceed to a comparison of the main hypotheses. Ptolemy's, Copernicus's, but also Tychus. They are discussed in Cartesian terms. For example, Descartes' philosophical definition of motion is used in Article 12, Chapter 12, uh, 24, a strategy that attracts more comments on Clark's part. In order to move to the next slide, I should only note that the aims of each author is different. While Rho struggles to make the new theories accepted and contrasts them with the traditional views, Clark is free to promote the Newtonian model. Rho's treatise contains only a few illustrations if compared to Descartes' Principles, part three, or even with Rehus's richly illustrated Philosophia Naturalis, to take another example from uh, the same period. Two of uh, Rho's illustrations are standard, the system of uh, Copernicus and that of Ptolemy. One depicts the recent discovery of the rings around Saturn and the, uh, the uh, others concern the distance between the Earth and the Moon, the retrograde uh, motion. There is one uh, image devoted to heaviness and one on the flux and reflux. It has been claimed before by Hoskin and Schuller, among others, that Clark improves the text of the treatise by making it more Newtonian. It is, in fact, the 18th century account of Hoadley and Wisdom. To my knowledge, no one has commented on the added sets of illustrations to Clark's editions of Hall. For the section on cosmology, Clark adds two sets of images in 1702, and Morgan complements them with several mathematical diagrams in 1710. Here are the pages with Clark's added images for the 1702 edition. They are preserved uh, in the succeeding reprints of the treatise. Diagrams complementing uh, mm, Charles Morgan's more mathematical annotations appear in 1710. It is beyond the scope of the current presentation to uh, go into details about this. Suffice to note the different style of illustrations in Clark and Morgan. The second example I want to discuss today concerns the names that appear in the text of Rowe's book either in the original or in the various comments appended to the treatise. The long list of names you see now on the screen 
include some early modern philosophers and astronomers, but also ancient figures, including historians and political figures. Uh, curiously, Descartes' name is not present here. Um, I'll try to show in the next few slides that one can learn uh, from such list. Uh, and uh, I'll do this by discussing how uh, these names appear in different editions. For example, Rowe's original text of 1671 reveals an emphasis on the traditional figures in astronomy. Ptolemy's name appears uh, 27 times. There are 22 occurrences of Copernicus's, uh, 15th of Hipparchus, and 14th of Tycho. If we apply the same visualization to the index of names in Clark's comments to the second part of Rowe's treatise, we get a very neat representation with most of the slices representing only one occurrence of a name. This is the 1697 edition, where only a few names stand out. Newton's name appears four times, Pliny and Plutarch uh, three times each. There are changes in uh, the 1702 edition and in uh, 1710, with small changes in 1718 and more variations in the English version of 1723. I just want to highlight Morgan's contribution of uh, in, uh, in, uh, the 1710 edition, where Euclid and Huygens get mentioned four times each. By comparison, in 1710, uh, Clark's own comments referred mostly to Newton, Huygens, and Kepler. In 1723, all annotations to the second part of the treatise, as you can see on the right uh, uh, on the screen, include 17 occurrences of Newton's name, 11 for Huygens, and six for Kepler. While this might look like a minor point, affecting only the visual of the presentation, I want to argue that it helps to test our hypothesis regarding the layers of composition of the treatise. On the one hand, it helps to understand how Rouault reached the form of the published traité, and this can be done through a comparison between the unauthorized physique nouvelle and the traité. On the other hand, the composition, uh, sorry, on the other hand, the comparison of names in Legrand and Clark should draw our attention to what each of these authors perceived as important in a particular moment in which a new annotated edition was issued. So in 1682, 1697, 1702, 1710, 1718, and 1723. But let me try to reach some conclusions. Today, I've tried to offer some insights into the dynamics of the reception of Rowe's tre uh, treatise. So what do we learn from here? The most obvious conclusion is the confirmation of the traditional account regarding Clark's Newtonian annotations as already commented by Sarton, Hoskin, Schuller, and others. And this is visible if one compares Rowe's text of 1671 to the English version of Clark's notes in 1723. However, I find there is a more complex story to tell. And in this sense, I only have a partial confirmation for the hypothesis that each annotated publication of Rowe's treatise reflected the status of natural philosophy at that time. By going into details of Legrand's annotations, then moving to Clark's growing and changing notes, one should observe the convoluted reception of the treatise reflected in new illustrations, different names added in the comments, but also in a different concern from our authors. This might be equally true for Clark's intellectual evolution from uh, 1697 to 1710 up to 1723, 
but also for the readers of the treatise. The names of authors given by Clark, Morgan, and Legrand might have been important signposts for the readers of the age, indicating further readings, which were not at all the time critical, but also supportive for Rowe's arguments. But I should probably stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihina. Um, and thank you for keeping such a good time so that we have a lot of time for questions and comments. Jibi uh, Shank has a question. Hi. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, that was fabulous. I have a billion questions, but I'll try to contain myself. Um, I, I, I like your conclusion a lot, um, but or, and um, you focus on those editions where you can locate an author commentator on the edition. And I sort of want to ask you about that. And in particular, even with, even with Clark, even if it is the case that Clark maybe put pen and mathematical instruments to paper to do those diagrams, we know for sure that some other artist in a bookshop put them into metal plate engraving to make them printable in that way. Meaning that the production of these books is playing a role in the intellectual content. So one question there is, have you been able to find, and I will say this is one of the great quests that's incredibly difficult, evidence for the relationship between these printers, these publishers of these books and their authors. And here I, I go back to, I mean, many of them, including Descartes' works, right, are published posthumously. So we don't have the opportunity to have any kind of any correspondence, for example, or commentary from the actual author on the books themselves. Um, and yet that's part of the story, right, of their development that way. So what, what do you know? Have you thought about, for example, tracing the printer's names to other books they're producing um, and creating that as a kind of, you know, pie chart database of sort of how the books themselves are, are being received. And then one last question, you didn't follow, it seemed like there were um, editions of Wo if I read the chart right, that are not the result of commentators like Clark, but are just reissues. And that those are uh, in Paris and occasionally Lyon, but that there is a, a set of editions of the original in Amsterdam, for example, or in Dutch publishing houses. Do those, do you find that they reproduce exactly, including the, the number of illustrations, what Roeau's work had in it? Or is there a, an expansion, a more elaborate illustrative Roeau that's being published entirely then at the hands of these book publishers and printers where they're in effect bringing their own and shaping therefore the content of the work by their choice of what illustrations to add. I mean, and I know just the last comment, I know from my own work, I've been working on this set of issues precisely. There's a, an increased market after 1680 for lavishly illustrated treatises and all sorts. And that these are the, driven by publisher logics and market demand. But they're not just illustrations. They're also part of a, a sense in which artists and bookmakers are seeing themselves as full-fledged intellectual contributors. And the artists and the images are being talked about as actual content, not just illustration. And yet nowhere in the production of it are these recognized authors, these recognized natural philosophers like uh, Clark or Rowe. So what do you find in the sort of long tradition of Rowe publications into the 18th century that are simply reissues of his original works? Thank you very much. This is a very nice question. Uh, 
or set of questions. Um, I'll start with the first question because I think, uh, in a sense, it's easier to, to answer. Um, all uh, of Clark's editions of Rho uh, have been published by uh, uh, the same publisher. So it's uh, John Knapton who produced all of them uh, since 1697. And it might be the case, uh, I haven't uh, looked at uh, what was going on uh, in the production uh, to see if it's a different artist, if it's a different uh, wood plate that they were using. But it might be the case that they were uh, simply uh, reprinting the same kind of uh, 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 images. Um, I uh, only looked at uh, what has been added uh, with every new edition of uh, uh, role that Clark was uh, uh, producing. Um, regarding the other uh, uh, publishing houses, um, yeah, that's uh, mm, uh, a line of research that we want to uh, to push you because uh, mm, some of uh, uh, the imprints of the treaties, uh, as you said, uh, mm, uh, were not only in Paris, uh, mm, uh, were also in Lyon, uh, in Amsterdam and uh, mm, uh, in other places. Uh, and not all of them were uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, directly linked to the original. Uh, so uh, some of them are uh, uh, pirated versions uh, uh, of the treaties. Just like uh, uh, it is the case with the Physique Nouvelle, which was published a couple of years ago uh, under Rowe's name. But we know that uh, it's uh, an unauthorized version of, uh, of the uh, uh, treatise. Um, and Rho explains this in his preface to the Traité de Physique in 1671. Uh, due to the popularity of his conferences in Paris, many of the notes taken by people uh, who were in the audience uh, have been uh, printed and sold as legitimate uh, uh, versions of his physics. And for this reason, he explains he has to publish uh, the Traité de Physique. It's interesting also to compare uh, the illustrations included in, uh, in Rowe's uh, Traité de Physique with what we get from the Physique Nouvelle, because the illustrations are not uh, uh, that different. Now, uh, of course, the issue of um, uh, 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 mm, how much uh, illustration uh, illustrations the treatise on natural philosophy can uh, uh, can have at that time? Uh, mm, it's different. It uh, it depends on uh, the place where it is published. It depends on uh, uh, mm, uh, mm, how well the book is going to be sold. Uh, so uh, there are many other uh, things to uh, to take into account. Uh, but to, to return to uh, your question and to, to my answer, um, we are planning to look at uh, what printers were doing. Uh, so who was printing Rowe? Uh, what uh, other treatises uh, the same printer uh, was producing? Were they using similar illustrations just because they were, uh, let's say, Cartesian, uh, to use the, uh, this label? Um, yeah, it's something to, uh, uh, to look. So thanks. Oh, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, Andreas Vitamine is next. Thank you. Um, I have a simple question. What, what motivated Clark to spend all this time on Rouault uh, years after um, uh, the Principia has been published? Rouault must have been perceived as a Cartesian author, I suppose. 
thanks. This is the classical question because uh, oh, okay. uh, I think um, we don't have a, a very good answer for, uh, for this uh, question. Mm -hmm. Uh, one answer is uh, what Winston uh, uh, said in uh, uh, his uh, memories uh, about the uh, life of Samuel Clark, uh, where he claims that Samuel Clark uh, was already a Newtonian when he uh, began to translate uh, Rose's uh, treatise. And he was uh, making the text more Newtonian with uh, every single uh, Edition. However, uh, if we pay attention to the content of uh, Samuel Clarke's uh, annotations, um, this claim is not uh, taken for granted in the sense that uh, the first two editions of Samuel Clarke um, are not that Newtonian. Um, I, I don't want to say that Newton's name uh, is not important for Clark, but uh, I just want to say that uh, Samuel Clark sometimes it's uh, very supportive for uh, the Rose arguments. And sometimes he even uh, provides references to other Cartesians saying, look, uh, this argument here, uh, it's rather weak. Uh, if you want to uh, find out more about this topic, you should read Malbranche, or you should read uh, uh, Régis. Uh, it's curious. Régis uh, is uh, deleted from uh, the other editions. So this happens only uh, in 1697. Um, after that, um, Clark adds more comments about Newton. Um, and uh, after 1704, when uh, Clark uh, begins to uh, translate uh, uh, Newton's optics, uh, he gets acquainted with even more uh, of Newton's uh, natural philosophy. And uh, he's be uh, while he's uh, becoming familiar with uh, the content of uh, Newton's natural philosophy, he's also becoming acquainted with uh, uh, many Newtonians, such that uh, in, uh, in the 1710 edition, uh, Samuel Clark is being helped by others to provide more content and to comment even more on uh, the text of the treatise. So uh, it's in a sense a natural development uh, that uh, we can see here with uh, Samuel Clark. Um, there are more questions, but I wanted to insert uh, a follow up on, on this why question and say that it's very tempting to see uh, the examples you gave us of successive editions of a textbook with editions of editors according, which are updating the content as a classic example of an articulation of Kuhnian paradigm, perhaps the best for the 17th century. Um, but, you know, jokes aside, isn't this what happens with textbooks earlier? So think of, the classic example of the sphere of Sacro Bosco who gets published century, well, century after century and decades after decades until mid 17th century, all the editions that all the editors want to put into it in the footnotes or in the main text. So the idea is that if you publish a textbook, you just update uh, what is in there with the latest knowledge. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with uh, what you've said. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add the following thing. Um, 
it has often been said that uh, Rouault's uh, uh, Traité de Physique uh, uh, quickly became the textbook on natural philosophy in several universities. And uh, um, what hasn't been uh, uh, well documented so far is uh, which parts of Rouault's treatise on natural philosophy were picked up uh, in, uh, in the curricula in uh, uh, some universities. So uh, what we are uh, currently trying to do is uh, to identify if some sections of uh, Rowe's uh, treatise uh, were uh, recommended uh, more to be read than uh, others. And how uh, students uh, were uh, reading this uh, uh, treatise. Uh, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in Cambridge and Oxford uh, in, in the early uh, 18th century, uh, Rouault was uh, uh, recommended for his optics. Uh, but of course, uh, what would be interesting now to see is um, uh, Mm, if sections of uh, 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 Rose treatise uh, were annotated by uh, any reader, uh, mm, and in order to do this kind of thing, we need to uh, go and look at uh, the available copies uh, in the libraries. Uh, uh, what we can do uh, for the moment is uh, look at the digital uh, mm, uh, copies that we have. And uh, in this respect, uh, looking at uh, mm, uh, the evolution of Clark's uh, notes, I think it's important because mm, uh, it might reflect not only the change uh, in, in uh, uh, Clark's knowledge of Newton's natural philosophy, but it might also reflect the kind of authors that uh, were supposed to be read by students at the university while reading or thinking about uh, topics such as uh, the motion of the planets, uh, the nature of matter and so on. So uh, this was uh, the hypothesis behind the list of names that I was trying to, uh, to compile uh, and to present today. Uh, and I think this is the reason why, uh, um, among other reasons, uh, Clark is changing uh, the names uh, and the references that he adds as comments to uh, Rose uh, Tratin. So yeah, it's an update. Thank you, Mihina. Dolores. Thanks so much, Mina. Um, a quick question. It's a historiographical question. So um, um, by the 18th century, you, you mostly have um, authors in natural philosophy looking forward and not um, like the 17th, at the beginning of the 17th century, where they were trying to reject this um, uh, this idea of uh, Renaissance humanist erudition. So there's a there's a difference. <laughs> there's a, a sharp divide that develops between erudition and um, and um, real progress in natural philosophy. So then it's very interesting that <laughs> in 1710 you get this extraordinary list of the most um, a ragtag <laughs> a list of authors which are not only not only uh, natural philosophers but are politicians and and uh, political writers and um, poets and things like that so so this is a very odd list so I'm I, I'm asking to myself what why is he putting all of these people into this text and is it because you know, in the first eleven, you, which is a cricket term, you know, you, you, you just look forward. But if you're in the second eleven and you're writing textbooks, you have to make make sure people respect you as a serious author. 
I don't know. Is that the re is that the way to read this list, or is it really, tr or is there a second wave of erudition in the 18th century where you have to show that you have uh, taken account of everything that has written before? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, I... <laughs> It might look like a simple uh, question and a simple answer, but I don't think it is. Uh, and uh, mm, I'll give you uh, a brief example from uh, Clark, who is actually showing uh, signs of erudition, as you said. Uh, because uh, at uh, uh, one point in uh, the treatise, uh, he adds um, uh, a note to um, a phrase where Ho was referring to some ancients who thought this and that. But uh, it's clear from Rowe's text that uh, mm, it's just uh, mm, a brief uh, mm, uh, mention of uh, uh, the opinion of the ancients without developing this in the direction of erudition. But Clark's note goes into the opposite direction and he provides the needed references to Pliny and to Plutarch. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Clark's uh, reference, uh, if we want to push further on uh, uh, this topic uh, of erudition, uh, uh, Clark's uh, uh, footnote, uh, actually, it's not a footnote in the first two editions, uh, it's an endnote, and after that, it's turned into a footnote. Uh, but uh, uh, Clark uh, comments um, um, has also um, uh, a quote. Uh, the reference. It's also how to present uh, this. Uh, and um, so, is there still a live? Um... Um, engagement with the ancients at this point? Uh, it might be uh, uh, um, linked to the fact that the first set of annotations prepared by Samuel Clark uh, happens uh, immediately uh, after his graduation. So this is uh, rather early in 1697. Uh, mm -hmm. And probably uh, he wanted also to show that uh, he was aware of uh, uh, all these uh, details. And uh, in the uh, uh, other editions that followed, uh, he uh, uh, kept uh, the note there without uh, deleting it, because it was, in a sense, neutral to uh, what was going on. Um, but uh, I find it interesting to see that uh, uh, his comments are not uh, always pushing uh, towards uh, a Newtonian reading of the text. I'll just add one more thing. I mean, the reason um, th that I think it's not surprising that all of these, the list of rather unusual list of ancients is, um, uh, is mentioned is that if you actually read um, the, we go through all of the philosophical translations, uh, transactions, say from 1665 to uh, 1680 or so, you get an enormous amount of erudition within the, the philosophical transactions, especially um, in physics and in medicine, um, uh, physics, medicine, and, and astronomy. So there's a way in which um, maybe in a kind of underground way in certain respects, um, um, knowledge of the ancients is considered a kind of um, entry point into to any discipline. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right, there is also a very useful comment of Tilly Shank on this point in the chat, Mihna, you might be interested in. Um, but Dan Garber is next with a question. Um, Mihna, thank you so much for this really, really interesting um, material. I love 
what it is that you're doing with these with these different editions. Just a brief comment on um, why ho ho, and it seems to me Donna is right about the the way in which textbooks do um, get revised. Um, but it's interesting that it started with that ho ho uh, had this status. I mean that that he, that Cartesianism became sort of the textbook that at least many people were were interested in updating at that point. And I think that, uh, and JB may correct me on this, but it may simply reflect the continuing influence of um, uh, Cartesianism even after um, Newton's Principia. But my, the, the, the thing that I was um, interested in was the relative unimportance of Copernicus and Galileo in the annotations and the relative importance of Kepler in there. You know, Kepler, Kepler is, you know, seems to get bigger and bigger. And the the the, the size of the pie or a slice of the pie for Galileo and Copernicus seem to get um, um, smaller and smaller. And I'm wondering why it is that you may think that is. My hypothesis would be it may be the importance of Kepler for Newton. Um, it certainly is reflected, for example, in Leibniz's interest in Kepler um, at um, just about the same time when he's working on his own cosmology. Uh, the Tentamen uh, has got a lot of Kepler in it. It may also be the fact that Galileo and Copernicus were um, more theoreticians than careful observers. And the thing about Kepler, of course, is, you know, the very careful observations and the very careful reconstruction of um, 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 the actual trajectory of the planets, which of course was crucial, certainly um, for um, astronomy and um, cosmology. Um, in the in the in the late um, 17th and into the 18th century, and to a certain extent, one one might say that Galileo and Kepler's more impressionistic view, the idea of basically circular um, uh, trajectories for the planets, had become sort of old-fashioned and irrelevant to the state of the science at that point. But Kepler was still very much, um, perhaps. Um, 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 relevant to what it is that people were actually doing. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. This is very inviting because um, in, uh, Galileo and Copernicus uh, are actually prominent uh, in, in Rowe's treatise. So Rowe uh, speaks about uh, Copernicus, of course, when he compares the various options uh, in, uh, of the world systems. But he also praises Galileo several times in the treatise, saying uh, in, in Galileo's astronomical observations uh, are uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, actually game changers, uh, in, uh, in, because now we can uh, understand better what is going on. Uh, and uh, 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 he's also praised for uh, uh, the use of the telescope. Uh, so uh, uh, it's in a way uh, uh, an important figure for uh, for Paul. But this doesn't happen uh, uh, with Clark. Uh, Galileo is not uh, important anymore at the end of the century. Uh, and what happens in terms of names uh, for, uh, uh, for Clark is that the three key figures are Newton, Kepler, and Huygens, which all of them are discussing the motion of the planets. Uh, so uh, it's a different problem uh, that Clark wants to emphasize. Yeah. Uh, for all, the problem is how can we accommodate the new astronomical observations uh, and how can we get rid of the traditional way of explaining things? 
but this problem uh, is not any more a problem uh, in, in Clark's time. Does Ho talk about Kepler? No. Descartes doesn't talk about Kepler either. And uh, uh, there are also uh, many other uh, interesting details. For example, mm, uh, mm, uh, Clark changes um, uh, the Latin term for uh, mm, uh, uh, describing uh, mm, an elliptical motion. And this happens uh, after the second edition. So only in 1710. Uh, up to that point, he was uh, discussing about uh, n n n n motion taking place uh, on a conical section, but not necessarily uh, n n uh, on uh, an ellipse, uh, which will become more and more important as other figures are going to, to show up. So uh, yeah, it would be interesting to, uh, to put together the, the list of names also with uh, in, uh, in, uh, key technical terms that are being altered uh, in, uh, from one edition to another. Thank you. Right, this is kind of bringing us to the end. There is an interesting question of Dennis. Dennis, can you make it very, very, very short? Sure. Uh, the very short version uh, would be, uh, is, uh, does Rojo uh, accept uh, Descartes' definition of, uh, the strict definition, uh, strict conception of motion uh, in the principles 225? Yeah, that allows him, the Descartes, to say that the earth doesn't move in later in the principles 328, I believe. And um, without that, he can't quite get, get that result. Uh, but uh, Newton argues explicitly against all of this, uh, the vertex theory together with the account of motion in an unpublished uh, work, De Gravitationit. But uh, this wasn't published, but I, uh, Clark could have been aware of it. I have no idea whether he does or not. So uh, if uh, Rojo does accept this uh, account of motion, along with the word theory, he's just as susceptible to those criticisms. And uh, if he does, then cl does Clark note any of this in his annotations? Thanks. That's uh, <laughs> uh, it's not difficult to to, uh, to answer, but uh, uh, I need more time for uh, for it. Um, uh, um, for all, it's not a problem to say that the Earth is moving, uh, uh, as uh, uh, we have seen. Uh, it was uh, the case for uh, for Descartes in, uh, in the third part of the Principles. Um, but uh, uh, he's trying to uh, uh, put uh, uh, the uh, 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 cosmological view in, uh, in Cartesian terms. So uh, sometimes he's referring to um, in, uh, in Descartes' laws of, na of nature uh, without naming Descartes. He's referring to some laws of mechanics, uh, which can be uh, uh, taken also from Descartes, but also from others. Um, it's interesting to see that uh, Rho uh, mentions also uh, a couple of times uh, Huygens. Um, so uh, he's working with uh, all these ingredients, uh, but uh, he's trying to provide uh, uh, a general system based on uh, vortices. And all the time, uh, Almost all the time when Rho uh, uses uh, vortices uh, as a term in the second part of uh, his book, uh, Clark adds uh, a comment saying, look at my comment uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a particular chapter. 
uh, and uh, mm, uh, he will comment on uh, mm, uh, the problem of uh, mm, basing uh, mm, the cosmological view uh, on uh, mm, the vortex theory. And that's clearly uh, Newtonian. So, uh, yeah, Clark is commenting uh, and he is rejecting uh, that. We don't know for sure if uh, Clark's comments are based on uh, Degrave because uh, uh, we don't know if uh, he was able to, to see or to hear from uh, Newton uh, that uh, uh, argument. Right. Um, thank you, Michna. Thank you all. This is the end of our session. Uh, please do switch on your mi microphones now and let's clap the three speakers and uh, thank them for this fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you, Migna. That was great. <laughs> thank you all. Next See you next week. Next week is Spinoza. Okay, so see you next week. Have a nice week. Bye. Bye-bye.